And with that, let's just make a start. So hoping you all can see the slides. Can I assume that yep. is the case? Yes. Brilliant. Yeah, okay. It, yeah. So thanks so much for joining me, guys. Welcome to the webinar on journal submissions, writing, preparing, and revising manuscripts. Today, I just want to give you a nice little crash course on selecting a journal, preparing a submission, you know, writing your paper, and basically just tips for getting through the entire journal process. So I am Nadine. I am a fourth year PhD student. And I have basically been through the rigmarole of working with journals quite a bit, the highs and quite a lot of the lows. So I'm going to try and explain to you a bit of my experiences and what I've learned from it, a lot of what my supervisors have told me to get through this, some little tips and things that don't, people don't necessarily tell you, but are the kind of loopholes that you can get through to academia. And this you know, little webinar has been designed with, you know, psychologists and psych students in mind, but can be applicable to anyone really. And I do want to preface this by saying that there is this kind of mentality that it's, you know, publish or perish. And I don't think that's the case. I really don't want to scare anybody. Please do not think that. I don't think psychology is there yet, the way other sciences are you won't you know, burst into flames and your career won't die if you haven't published. You know, you'll still get onto the courses you want if you haven't necessarily published. But having this knowledge in your arsenal is useful. It's a burden off of you going in, knowing how these things kind of work. It's just something that you know. You don't have to stress out about it, basically. That's all I'm saying. So. We're gonna start by talking about how to select a journal, finding a home for your paper and why you should do it before you've even started writing your paper. Then how to actually go about writing your paper, tips for each section and beyond. Preparing your actual submission, you know, what actually goes into the manuscript beyond the actual research. And for those of you who've never seen the portals, what actually the portal looks like and how to work with reviewers. So revisions and what's actually expected from the editor and the reviewer. So selecting a journal, my recommendation to you would be that even as you're conducting your study, whether you know it's something as simple as a review, a systematic review, or a full-fledged qualitative quantitative study or trial, in your mind, start thinking about where could this study possibly be published? And before you even start writing the manuscript, have an idea of where it should go. Why? Because even though in your undergrad, you've been taught about academic writing, you know, there's an intro method, you know, discussion and all of that, and there's a certain academic writing style. No two journals are the same, there are different lengths. Dur journals, you know, some have a 3,000 word limit, some have a 6,000 word limit. Some of them have sections of different lengths. Some of them have very short methods. Some of them have very long methods. Some of them have different writing styles from others. Some of them allow for a lot of technical words. Others are more casual now, and that's starting to happen in academia. Journals are slowly starting to adopt a more casual, still academic, but starting to drop the jargon, starting to understand that we need to be more accessible. So you need to understand from each journal, the writing style is gonna differ. Each journal, from journal to journal, the level of detail is gonna differ. So if you've written your manuscript in one way, and then you realize, oh, the journal, the detail is different, you're gonna have to rewrite the whole thing. From each journal, the sectioning is gonna be different. One journal might only expect intro, method, results, discussion. Another one might say, well, in your intro, we want you to have subsections and even sub-subsections. So the sectioning might differ from journal to journal. You also have to think about your audience. This is a particularly important one. Are you trying to reach a really niche group? 
So for example, I, my research is around dementia in South Asians. So when I publish my research, am I trying to reach a very global audience, all doctors or all psychologists, or am I trying to reach only those people who are doing work with ethnic minorities? Am I reaching a very niche group? That's gonna determine which journal I wanna to go to. Do I wanna reach everybody or just a specific group? Am I trying to go national or international? That's gonna matter. There's a gamble there. International means a wider audience. It also means, you know, maybe people are gonna to wanna to replicate what you do in their own country, but it also might be tougher to publish in an international audience because you've done something for your country. They'll be like, well, does this really apply to us? National is more likely to publish you, but international looks more glamorous. So it's a choice you're making. And then certain journals will have prerequisites. So for example, patient and public involvement is becoming very popular nowadays. Certain journals are starting to sneak this in into the requirements that we kind of want you to have done PPI work or we won't publish you. Or you better have a good excuse for not having done PPI work. So imagine having chosen that journal and then realized, oh, we didn't do the work. Sometimes um, they have to start, start certain journals expect you to have the consent forms actually on you in hard copy or soft copy, copy format. And if you've already, for example, gotten rid of them or you don't actually have them on you, you could be in another country, they need to see the actual format, you're in trouble. Some journals have different data sharing agreements that your institution may not agree with. These are all complex things that yes, your supervisor can help you with but there are prerequisites that you need to determine. So it's a good idea to know what your journal is gonna work out. So let me give you a case example. Once you kind of figure out what you wanna go for, you might think, well, okay, but where do I even start looking for a journal? We think, well, you know, we just Google psychology journal and that's a bit of a limited pool, but actually there's a whole breadth of journals. There's hundreds and thousands of journals to choose from with a very wide audience. And let me give you an example. So I do culturally adapting dementia tests for British South Asians. So that means it is an area of psychology so my specific subject to study, I can Google psychology journals. That'll give me all the little journals in psychology. But I can also go for specific areas within psychology, clinical psychology journals, counseling psychology journals, health psychology journals. But I can go for broader areas of study. I can also go for psychiatry journals, mental health, nursing, medicine. I can also search for journals around my population. So I'm doing work in South Asians. That means I can also search for journals around minorities, South Asians, aging populations, older populations. So not necessarily mental health and psychology. So this will be a completely different audience, but nevertheless, a pretty wide audience. I can also go towards the condition itself, dementia, cognitive impairment, geriatric disorders. It's going broader, wider, possibly even international at this point. I can go topical, cultural, ethnicity, diversity. I can even go methods, research methods, qualitative methods, mixed methods, methods in psychology. And when it comes to methods, it's more likely that people are going to want to follow your methods and start replicating your methods, possibly cite your research and copy those methods. So these are the things to kind of think about when you're picking a journal. You don't necessarily have to leap towards psychology. And in fact, when I did publish my research, these are the journals I went towards. I went towards clinical psychology, yes, but I went towards BMC Psychiatry, Psychiatry Journal, BMJ Open, Medicine, and then two methods journals, BMC Research Methods and International Journal of Methods in Psychiatric Research. So two methods-based journals. So that gives you an idea of the diverse range of journals that are there. 
So and all of this can be done, just keep Googling journals in the different areas. But of course that means you're getting lots and lots of journals in your face, There's so much information. How do you narrow it down? What's the good journal? Where do you go? There are some standard numbers that institutions look at for journals. The most popular ones are open access. You might've heard of open access. Open access basically means that the publisher has decided or to make the paper accessible to the public. It's this big thing that the idea behind it is that essentially the public funds research, right? The taxpayer is funding the government, the government funds the institution, the institution funds the research. And essentially, if that research, which is then being published, isn't accessible to the public, that's not fair. They should get to read the research they have funded in this cycle. But open access is very expensive because the burden of the price goes on the author. When I say expensive, I mean the prices range from 1,500 pounds to 3,000 pounds. Sometimes it goes up to 6,000 pounds. So open access, there are different types of open access. There's something called gold open access. And that means the copyright belongs to the author. The author can share it with anybody. It can be published anywhere. They can show it to anybody they want. There's no limits on it. Then there's green open access. The copyright belongs to the institution that the author belongs to. The institution can share it with anyone, but the author cannot. So there's a lot of debates around open access. You know, the costs are exorbitant. It doesn't seem fair. Why should the publisher get to charge so much when the researcher has gone and done all the efforts? It's, it's a whole debate that I won't get into too much, but pretty much it's the craziest business model in the world. So you need to think about it. Yes. Do you want to go for an open access journal because so many people will get to read your research, but also can you afford to do it? You might want to look into something called hybrid journals. These are journals that offer open access options, but offer closed options too. So they do both. You can pay a charge and they will make it open. But if you don't want to pay the charge, it'll be closed. They'll still publish it but it won't be open to the public. People will have to pay a charge. And usually that charge is somewhere between 30 or 50 pounds to access the paper. It is absolutely ridiculous, but it is the reality we live in. So open access fees, if you are unaffiliated, like I said, it follows with, falls with the author. If you are affiliated with a university, for example, the university usually has a pot of public access fees you can usually ask the library and they will tell you, yes, we have a certain amount of fees every year that we allocate to open access publications. The same goes for NHS departments. They have funding allocated for open access fees, but that doesn't always mean that they can just give it to anybody. It is usually allocated towards the most high end necessary publications. For example, these days it's going towards COVID research. So a lot of the times, for example, psychology researchers have to stick to non-open access journals, which isn't great, but that's kind of where we have to stick to. Another thing you have to consider with journals is impact factor. What is impact factor? In very simple terms, it is the measure of the number of times an average paper from a journal is cited in the previous two years. I know it sounds kind of complicated. Basically from a, that journal, an average paper, how many times was it cited in the past two years? That would be its impact factor. A five-year impact factor would be how many times from that journal the average paper was cited in the past five years. So, an average semi-good journal would be about, the impact factor would be one to two. A good, even great impact factor would be somewhere between two to three to seven. X 
excellent journals are about seven plus. And then the scary high quality journals that publish the biomedical sciences, those big names, nature, science, and the economic journals, those have like 30. So psychology is somewhere between the 2.3 to 7 impact factor. And that's not bad. That is a very good impact factor to have. So if you're publishing papers with an impact factor of 2.5, 3.1, 4, you are great. You are doing really, really well in the realm of psychology. Even in the realm of science, you are doing excellent. Don't get worried about impact factors if you are in this realm. It's a really good impact factor to have. Then there's something called indexing. This is really important. So for those of you who are familiar with systematic reviews, when you do a systematic review, you search different databases, right? You might've heard of them, PubMed, PsycInfo, Medline, Embase. If you're not familiar with systematic reviews, these are big databases that connect to different journals, lots of different journals, hundreds and hundreds of journals. Indexing basically means that that journal can be found on a database. So you need to check if a journal is indexed on a database. So if you go on a journal's website and you check its indexing, so you can find that in the about the journal and you check under indexing, it'll give you a list of which databases that journal can be indexed in, which databases can that journal be found in. And you want it to be found in at least one of these big ones, PubMed or Medline, Embase, PsycInfo, you want it to be found in one of these because that means if someone does a literature review or systematic review on psychology or psychiatry, mental health, they're going to be able to pick up on your paper if it's relevant to their subject matter. If it's not indexing one of these databases, that means your paper is never going to get picked up in relevant reviews. That's not a good thing. So it's really important to look up indexing. So these are the big relevant ones when it comes to finalizing journals. And then the slightly minor things we can look into are when you start writing the introduction section of your paper, have a look at what kind of papers you're including in your introduction section and what journals those papers belong to because very likely those journals are probably a good fit for your paper. Also very likely, journals kind of like to self-cite because it boosts their impact factor. So it's a little thing, but basically if you're citing their paper, they might want to include your paper, if it's a good paper. Um, another thing is obviously Look at the aims and scopes of the journal. Do you even fit the remit? Do you fit the criteria? Make sure it's correct. Might be that journal doesn't include a review and you've written a review. Make sure the fit is good. Look at the turnaround. Some journals actually put how long it takes for them to review the paper, how long it takes to distribute it to reviewers, how long the reviewers take to send back their response and their decision, how long publication takes. If it's something like a year or two years, you don't wanna publish there. But if they're giving you something like, oh, it takes us 60 days for our reviewers to get back to us, and then it takes us 30 days to get a final decision, that's a pretty good response. That is a journal I would want to work with. So turnaround is a really good response. And then keep compiling a little database and a spreadsheet of journals. I spent the last few years collecting just information about journals and their impact factors. I keep updating it because having that now, whenever I have an idea for a paper, I immediately kind of go to my little database and I have a look like, oh, what journal might this be suitable for? And having that list of journals there 
is very helpful. So keep building it. It's going to be so useful through your career. Even if you don't plan to be a researcher through the rest of your career, even if you are going to be primarily a clinician, maybe here and there you might be involved in a paper, having a list of journals is always beneficial. Okay, let's get on to writing your paper. So when it comes to writing your paper, usually one author is responsible for writing the manuscript. One author will take the lead, but all the authors, all the researchers responsible for the study need to see the manuscript before it's submitted to the journal. They need to provide their feedback. It should never be that one author does not see it before it goes in. And when you write the manuscript, be a reviewer as you write it. Once you've written that first draft, go over it as a reviewer would. And even get others to do it. Because if you can get ahead of what the reviewers are going to say, you're going to beat them at their own game. And APA recommends this criteria. They call it finer. This is what reviewers use when they review a manuscript. So they see if it's the research is feasible. So realistically, could it be done again? Could it realistically be done in other settings? Was it even realistic the first time or did researchers really have to push themselves? Was it interesting? Firstly, is the paper even interesting to read or is the writing quality incredibly technical and boring? Is the research itself interesting? And that's a bit of a tricky one because sometimes research doesn't necessarily have to be interesting to be important. So it's a balance. Sometimes interesting can mean important. Is it novel? Has anyone else done this work before or is it completely new? And if it's not completely new, is it replicating something? Because we're in the era of replication. So is it replicating someone or, or is it doing something that's been done before, but for a new setting or a new population? Is it ethical? So is it proper and is it moral and have all the ethics been undertaken? Have the ethics been described? And is it relevant? Does it fit with the current time, the current issues, and does it build upon the current breadth of literature? So this is what reviewers are basically gonna be following when they review the manuscript. Some general rules to essentially follow when you are writing a manuscript. It's always useful to have an outline. Start off with each section for your intro methods, results, and discussion. Have some headings and subheadings. Even if you get rid of them later, just building an outline of the skeleton of what your manuscript is gonna look like is gonna be really helpful. Instead of just starting with a blank page and writing willy-nilly, having the bullet points is gonna be incredibly helpful. Be critical of everything. Be critical of the methods that you use. Be critical of your setting and population. So did you have a very limited population? Was it representative? Is, was your sample representative of your population? Consider the demographics, consider the timing, consider if there was bias, consider the studies that you mentioned in your introduction and be critical of those studies and if they had been successful previously or not. Justify everything that you've done. Justify, for example, I was once asked, I had said, you know, I had participants and I gave them 24 hours to decide if they wanted to participate because this is standard. And I was asked why 24 hours to decide to participate. So I had to justify it, which was, I don't know how I did it, but it was like, well, the ethics had recommended. And so you had to explain it. You have to justify absolutely everything. Be prepared to do this, whether it's with references or because an ethics board had recommended it, just prepare to justify everything. You can always cut down later according to reviewer recommendation, but it's better to have the justification in there now. Don't assume that everyone knows universal facts. Avoid causal language. Avoid things like most, best, due to, because of, unless you have strong evidence to back it up because you will be called out on it. 
So unless you have the concrete quantitative or qualitative proof, avoid these words. Be aware of technical language. I wouldn't say avoid it because, well, this is science. Sometimes you have to use technical words, but if you're going to use it, especially if you're working with a broader journal, your audience might not necessarily be aware of the terminology. So be prepared to explain it. For example, I use the term false positive scores because I thought, well, this is something a lot of people would know. But I was asked by the reviewer that I should explain what false positive scoring is. So I do one line, one very simple line. What is a false positive score? I just wrote it down. False positive score where a person was diagnosed with dementia, even though they didn't have dementia. So whether it's a line, a paragraph, explain your technical terminology. And most importantly, create flow. Do not have long, lengthy eight, nine, 10 sentence paragraphs. Keep it short, keep it snappy. Six sentence maximum, really. And those sentences should be short. And a varied length. Have a few short sentences, one long sentence, and then a few short sentences. They say that it should be like a song. Varied length keeps a reader awake. You don't want them to get used to your writing. You want them to be constantly wondering what's going to happen, create flow. And now we're going to talk about the different sections of a standard paper. So just a few tips on the different sections, title, abstract, introduction, methods, results, and discussion. So when it comes to the title, think of the title as having two portions what the aims and the findings were, and then the methods that were used. And just to give you an example, these are literally the top mental health searches I found today. As you can see in all of them, the first parts are what their aims and their findings were. And the second portion was how they did it. So for example, the first one is, understanding parental health seeking behavior when accessing unscheduled care, colon, a qualitative study. And then the next one, you know, internet delivered CBT for adults with prolonged grief, colon, a study protocol for a randomized feasibility trial. This is a really good way to just do a simple title. So aims findings first, colon, methods used. Just do this. It's the easiest, best way to do a title. And then for the abstract, it's usually going to be about 250 to 300 words. And these are usually the structure for the abstract they expect of you. Background, methods, results, findings, or background, objective, methods and results, conclusions. But essentially, the information that is really important is going to be the kind of stuff that needs to be picked up from a systematic review in the abstract screening, which is what was found, how was it found, and what does it mean? This is what reviewers want from that abstract. Reviewers are busy people. They are doing this for free. They want to be getting this information at a first glance. Make this as easy as possible for them make this information pop from the page. What was found? How was it found? What does it mean? Quick, snappy. That's what the abstract should say. Stick to the bare minimum. So usually this will be stuff like the target demographic population, the condition or intervention that was being explored, and the outcome or the findings. Basically, that's it. With the introduction, why was this research needed? You need to persuade the reader why this research was needed. So usually this will be, um, sorry, one second, a general description of the problem. So this will be, you'll need to talk about the prevalence or incidence of the disease or the condition. You'll need to talk about the impact, talk about cost, You'll need to talk about the general description if it's the intervention, like are you talking about a therapy? Talk about, you know, how has this therapy 
how its rates of success, has it cut costs, its impact, has it reduced prevalence, has it reduced incidence, mention all of this, use lots of statistics. And usually, depending on your journal, you'll have to decide, is there gonna be an international versus national comparison? If you're going for an international journal, so we're in UK, but you've decided to go for an American journal, you're gonna need to start with statistics about global. So for example, I'm doing dementia research, I'm going to need to talk about dementia in a global context, how many people it affects globally, how many people it, you know, how many people die from it globally, how many people are diagnosed globally. And then I'll start talking about UK. But if I'm applying to a UK journal, then I might jump straight to UK. I won't even bother with a global context. It won't be necessary. And I'll go straight into the UK costs and stuff like that. So that international versus national context is really important. And then it's really important to criticize the solutions. And I know it may seem counterintuitive. You talking about your research, you don't want to start talking about how other people have tried to solve the problem. But you have to, you have to talk about how other people possibly tried to do the same thing you did and maybe even semi succeeded. You need to provide that context. Give at least two to three examples of how they might have succeeded, maybe did really well in some settings, maybe, you know, got really far, but then also provide some criticism that this is what didn't work. Or maybe this is where they could have done better, but they didn't. Um, or maybe they got this far, but this is where I'm going to make it better. And then out with the old. Try to avoid literature older than five years and definitely avoid literature older than 10 years because this will be critiqued. If there really isn't any literature because no one explored this area and you're the first to do it, you be the one to critique it. Mention how old the previous studies are and the time gap. So you're the one to get ahead of it. Beat the reviewers to this. Mention in the intro and bring this up in the discussion again that this is so unexplored and in no time no one has explored this. This is very rare that this happens, but it does sometimes. And you need to be the one to bring this up. And you can do rough literature searches and systematic searches on databases and restrict the years to double check that has anyone done any research in the last five to 10 years on this area or is it truly unexplored? And then finally, do not forget to mention your aims and objectives. Some people forget to do this because they think, oh, after my introduction, I'm gonna start with my methods. I'm telling them exactly what I'm about to do. But you still need to mention at the end of your introduction, your aims and objectives. What's the difference? Your aim is what you propose to do. So what you think your findings are gonna be and what you want to investigate, how your research is gonna be different from what others have done and how it might address the gaps. And your objectives are the very literal steps to how you're gonna address the gaps. It's kind of like a summary of your methods. It's how you propose to do the aims. The aim is the idea, the objective is the execution. So the objectives is how you're gonna investigate it. It's kind of a few lines on the methods. And the method is, how was the research done? So the methods need to be perfectly replicable enough information that anyone can conduct this exact same study or search without getting lost in unnecessary details. You need to provide perfect context. So if you did calculations for things like sample size, you need to provide those. If you had to come up with an idea for qualitative study numbers, so you know this many participants, for thematic saturation, you need to provide an answer for how you reach that number, a reason. If you were using new methods or non-standard methods, 
you need to describe those methods. You can't just provide a reference that, oh, we use this new method that so-and-so designed referenced here. No, provide a little paragraph explaining that method. Provide a little summary. Describe the software and version number of the software that you used, stats or qualitative, either way. And you can even provide a line or two on the background of the authors that were involved directly in the study to show how they match the sample or are qualified to conduct the research. Because this can help other people design studies with researchers suitable for those studies. And for example, I work with ethnic minorities and it is very useful to us to know how researchers are matched to the samples that they're working with. So researcher characteristics are becoming more important to report in studies for different kinds of groups. Elaborate. Don't say participants were randomized. Describe the process of randomization. Don't say participants were blinded or double blinded. Describe the process of blinding. Don't just say ethics was obtained. Say, who was it obtained from? Who was the body that was obtained from? Was it an NHS body? Was it university ethics? Which body was it obtained from? Ideally, provide the ethics number. If your study was registered with someone, which happens with clinical trials, provide the registration body and registration number. Provide the process of obtaining informed consent. This is becoming more and more important, especially with vulnerable populations. And quality assessment. This is becoming very important slowly with a lot of journals. This is to determine whether your manuscript is of a good quality. It is, I'll show you guys basically. There is a website called the Equator Network. And they have these reporting guidelines for different kinds of studies. You can see they have them for randomized trials, case reports, qualitative research, all kinds of things. You can go on this website and basically select the kind of guideline that applies to your kind of study. And it'll have a checklist that'll show you how to write your manuscript. So for a qualitative study, for example, it'll say, okay, in your method section, in your sample section, have you said what ethnicity the participants are, the age of the participants? Have you said how the participants were recruited? Have you said if they were blinded? Have you said if they were randomized? Have you described these processes? It basically very thoroughly provides a checklist for all the information your manuscript should provide. And I would say these guidelines aren't just great for writing a manuscript. They're pretty great to have on you while you're still doing your study. They can be really great to help you make sure you've done a really thorough study. So make sure you check out the Equator Network for their guidelines, really useful. And then we have the results section. So what was found from the research? Be very aware of how you're presenting your data. So one thing that journals really latch on to now is demographics and how we present demographics because they're very into protecting participant information. So for example, say you have this sample of participants, X, Y, Z, a table. This would no longer be acceptable in a journal because you can no longer have this much identifying information for each participant. Journals usually now say you can only have two categories per participant together. For example, you can now maybe have gender and age per participant or age and ethnicity per participant, but you can't have all four because the participant might be identifiable. A better way to do it might be something like this. It's not the cleanest table. Obviously, you would have a much nicer table. But something like this would make the participants far harder to identify. Or obviously, instead of having a table, you might just have a paragraph explaining the descriptive statistics. Never have a paragraph and a table 
where you could have one or the other. Reviewers don't like it. They don't like double information. And then when it comes to quantitative and qualitative, um, like we said, yeah, be conservative with your tables. And with qualitative, it's really important. With qualitative, we tend to gravitate towards the most descriptive and fascinating extracts. We can't help it, right? But make sure when you're doing that to span across your participants because obviously the more fascinating extracts tend to come from the same batch of participants. So example, if you have 25 participants, it might be that seven said the more fascinating things, but you don't wanna make it so that all your extracts are just from those seven participants. That looks really biased. You need to span it that it's at least half of the participants, if not more. Reviewers will, if it's a good reviewer, they will pick up on this. Make sure in your results to report losses. So if you lost participants, if there was a loss to follow up, if participants dropped out, have a nice flow diagram. Instead of reporting it in a paragraph, have a proper flow diagram showing at which stages you lost your participants. Did you lose them at the recruitment stage? Did you lose them at the first interview stage or the first you know, experimental stage at the second experimental stage. These are the things that reviewers want to see. And when it comes to tables and figures, firstly, try and conserve them to one page. Because like I mentioned, you want to make your reviewers life easier. So they want to have an at a glance experience. So whether you need to switch to landscape, reduce the font, try to conserve it to one page. If you're listing papers in a table, people tend to list them by author, but you can try and get creative. Think about what your table is trying to represent. Are you trying to show a chronological trend? If you are, list the papers by year. Are you showing a global trend? Go in order of country. For my study, I was listing papers of different language versions of the test. So I went by language to show a trend. With figures, you're gonna have to check your journal. Some journals charge extra costs to publish figures of color. And that's why it's so important, again, to know which journal you're going for. So if it's an extra cost, you might wanna go with black or white figures. But if you're not getting charged for colors, go for colors because you get more representation, you get more, you know, pop off the block, you get, you know, it's easier for the reviewer to see what you're representing, but make sure the color combos that you're using are friendly for people who are colorblind. And they're very easy. You can easily Google combinations that are sensitive for colorblind people. And then what, the discussion section. What are the implications of your research? This is a section that a lot of people find really difficult, but it is a section that can be broken up and does become easier the more you practice with it. So a very important rule is that the discussion section should have no new literature introduced to it. The only new ideas in the discussion section should be from your research. That's it, no new other papers. You start with a summary of your findings. So it's all about a summary of your aims and whether you have achieved your aims or not. You start with a broad representation of, did I meet my aims or not? And then go into the specifics of what you found, any trends that you found. If the results are describing what you found, the discussion is now explaining what they mean and drawing implications from them and maybe even getting a little loose. You know, the results have to be very straightforward. You can't report more than what's there, but the discussion can. The discussion can start now taking implications. You can start deducing things. So start doing that in the summarizing section. And then you're gonna to have to start listing strengths of your research. 
So a lot of things will include things like, is your research novel? Is it the first of its kind? But you also might want to reflect on if you had a strong sample size, was it a diverse sample? Did you have any strong statistics, effect, power, significance? Were the findings explored exactly or more than expected? Did you provide any clear expectations or directions for future work? Did it slot in perfectly with gaps or build exactly upon the foundations of previous work? Did they provide a natural next step for what's gonna happen next? And did you provide any secondary aim? Did you work out with how to work with an underserved population or did you demonstrate how to work with a new method? Did you devise a new framework? Did you provide a guide or a template or a demonstration that other people can follow? Or did you replicate any research that had been previously done? And then the limitation section. This can be tough for people because it is reflecting on things that you've done badly and people think, oh, well, reviewers are gonna crucify me for this. But actually reviewers get annoyed if you don't reflect on this. While you're doing your study, keep note of any problems that you faced and any biases that emerge because this is gonna be fodder for your limitation section. So, you know, did you have a very poor return rate or did you have a lot of loss to follow up? Was your sample very biased, you know, or did it only represent a certain educational background or a certain ethnicity or a certain age background? These are all examples of limitations. Not necessarily your fault, sometimes they're just circumstances and they can all be written down. And you can always provide a reason for these. Some of them are really good justifications. And you can always follow up with a despite this. You can always follow up with a how they were addressed. So, you know, yes, maybe, you know, my, my sample was biased in that they only represented a certain educational background, but we still provided insight into this group and it provides, and then you can link to a future direction that future research might want to explore into other educational backgrounds. A limitation is just a future direction in a bad costume. That's what I always say. So always follow up a limitation with a future direction. And this is often seen in concepts like small sample sizes and non-diverse samples. And naturally that's when your future direction section will come. So this is when you need to talk about proposals into future work. What do you think could be a natural study that could happen next? But also what policy implications could come from this? What service implications could come from this? Reviewers want to see that you've thought about this. You've actually thought about how your research could help other people. And from here, you've got a written manuscript. It's prepared, it's ready to go. But not really, you have some tweaking to do. There are some basics you need to get prepared. There's referencing. So each journal has a different referencing style. It is the bane of every academic existence. A lot of them have predetermined styles and citations. Make sure that you check with the journal before you submit or the editor is gonna send it right back before it even gets to the reviewers that you need to change it. You need to determine who the corresponding author is. The corresponding author is the one who will submit the manuscript through the portal. They will receive all the emails from the journal, the editors and everything about the progress of the manuscript. You don't have to be the corresponding author. The first author doesn't have to be the corresponding author. It can be a completely random author. But the corresponding author is the one who is going to have to provide their email address, their office address, and their telephone. You have to double check with the journal if the title page needs to be sub submitted as a separate document or along with the manuscript as a whole document. If it's being submitted as a separate document, that means that the manuscript is gonna be submitted to reviewers anonymously. 
And if that's the case, that means that your full names should not be mentioned in any other part of the manuscript because reviewers should not know who you are. And if that's the case, remove the full author's names and use initials if necessary. And this is a perfectly normal practice. Initials are commonly used in manuscripts. You will need to include a running title. This is often a limited character version of your title. It's a very short version. I'm going to show you an example in a minute. It's a very limited version that can often be used to search databases because the long version is often too long and difficult. You'll have to come up with key words that people often use to search Google and databases for papers. And don't choose words that are already in your title because that's a waste. Use other words. So you can expand the search for your paper. So, and the keywords are usually placed under the abstract in your manuscript. And then the word count. So the word count will usually be right at the bottom of your title page. I'm just gonna show you an example of that in a second. So the word count will usually be everything from the introduction to the end of the discussion. It will not include the title page, the abstract, the references, or your appendices. It might include tables and figures, but usually it does not. This word count is usually mandatory until you get revisions from reviewers. After that, things are usually chill because once you put revisions from reviewers, your word count tends to go up, but editors don't hold you to that, they don't mind. So this is an example of a title page from a manuscript. And up here, you can see the title. Here, you can see the running title. It's an incredibly short version of the title. These are the authors. And over here, you can see the author affiliations. We were all from the same institution, but had we not been, it would just keep going down. Over here is the corresponding author and all of the corresponding author's details. And here's the word count. So this is everything you'd find on the title page. And in this publication's uh, situation, we had to submit the title page separately. Now, authorship is a pretty sensitive matter. Um, things get pretty bad over authorship sometimes because, well, you know, Relationships have been lost, people have had fights, it is what it is. Because first off, it's not easy to change. Once the order of authors is published, it, that's it. It really can't be changed. It's final. Authorship is not all about the actual writing of the manuscript. Authorship is dependent upon many other things, such as the actual conducting of the study. And that's why it's really quite important to decide authorship as a group and often decided by the supervisor. And the supervisor is usually the last author. So the academic or clinical supervisor, the person who is overseeing the project is the last author. First author would then be whoever did a majority of the study work or took lead on the study. So for example, a PhD student would be lead first author on their project. And then second author would be whoever did the most work after them and then so on and so forth. First and second author are usually coveted spots, especially at a early career researcher stage. But I'll be honest, you know, to get on any paper by assisting even a little through data collection, help or analysis is always a boost and it goes on your CV that can't be taken away from you. And that's always great. But due to issues around equal distribution of work, shared authorship is a concern as well. It's become a problem. So I'll give you an example. Two people are co-investigators. So X and Y have been co-investigators and have done equal amounts of work on a project. They were assisted by Z and supervised by A. What is the authorship? 
ideally X and Y would be first authors, Z would be second author, and the final author would be A, last author, because they supervised. If it was a particularly big study, you could split it into two papers. So X would get to be first author on the first paper, Y would get to be first author on the second paper, they both get two first author papers. And it's fair, it's, you know, it's equal. But that doesn't always happen. Sometimes you only get one study, one paper. So what's the tiebreaker? Sometimes writing can be the tiebreaker. So if Y wrote majority of the transcript and X only reviewed it, then Y could be first author, X would be second author. But if that was not the case and they truly all did an equal amount of work, what would happen? Sometimes journals allow joint authorship, which is equal to the ideal authorship. They will say there can be two first authors. And that's great. You, so they will allow you to have two first authors. And you can do this by putting a footnote on your title page to indicate that there were two first authors. But, and this is, again, another thing to consider when selecting a journal check if they allow joint authorship. But again, not all journals do this. And maybe there's a journal that you really got your heart set on and they just do not allow joint authorship. Another thing you can do is consider utilizing author contributions. This is now something that journals really take seriously. They allow you to put a proper description of what each and every author did. So that it will be published there in the paper, everyone can see the equal contribution. So even though over here, we see that X is the first author, in the contributions, it's very clearly stated, X, Y, and A formulated the research question and designed the study. X and Y developed the research materials, carried out recruitment and conducted data collection. X, Y, and Z transcribed the data. X, Y, and Z analyzed the data. X and Y wrote the first draft and revisions of the draft. All authors reviewed the final draft of the manuscript. A supervised the entirety of the project. This is a very standard author contribution statement. And it shows A supervised the project. It showed that Z was a bit of an assistant and that X and Y pretty much led the project and had a very equal hand in the work that they did. Additional statements that will go into your manuscript and have now pretty much become mandatory for journals. So these journals will either have predetermined statements on their website, which you can find in author guidelines sections on the website, and you can copy paste them from the website, or you can create your own version and pop them in. You can pop in a conflict of interest statement. This is really important to have. You have to write the authors have no conflicts of interest to disclose. Some journals will also insist that you print off their conflict of interest form and every author will have to sign this form and this will have to be uploaded to the portal. There will also be a funding portion and you will have to write this research receive no specific grant from any funding agency in the public, commercial or not-for-profit sectors. If you are funded, you could say this research was funded by da 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 funding body. And then there's something called data availability. Your supervisor will often be able to help you with this, but essentially your research, if you have a data set, this can be you know, participant quotes, it can be you know, quantitative data that you found. If you've created some kind of data set that you would like to share with somebody, you have to create a data availability statement that you have to put at the end. Um, these are the various options that you have. So you can either put it as a supplementary material, you can put it up as a repository on a website and say that it's available at this location. If you're not wanting to share it, you say the research data is not shared. Um, if you don't want to put it up somewhere, but you say that they can contact the corresponding author, you could put, these are just all the statements and often the journal website will have a statement that you can just copy paste that is applicable to you. And then 
acknowledgements. So these are all the people that you should ideally acknowledge. It is pretty common to now acknowledge people who helped facilitate your research, whether it was reviewing your manuscript, helping you write your manuscript, helping you acquire funding, gatekeepers or community fellows who helped you recruit, anybody who helped you with software and technical, technical help, and of course, your participants. And finally, you have to produce a covering letter to go with your manuscript. So the covering letter, this is a standard one that I use. So the covering letter often looks something like this and you write it to the board of your journal title. You say that you're pleased to submit to your manuscript title. The reason you give for submitting will often come from your introduction. So you provide an argument for why you did this along with your aims. You use the journal aims and the manuscript aims as a reason for submitting. And that is basically what a standard covering letter should look like. So it doesn't have to be very long, but it is quite important to have one. So I'm just going to give you guys a quick look at what the portal looks like. I can account for a journal. So this is a typical journal port portal. Uh, making account is really easy. Uh, you can use any email address and they'll only ask you for your name and you really just need an email, make up a random password. It's like making an account for absolutely anything. You can see the options here. You have your home, author, and review. So for example, if you're a reviewer, you could also review as well. You go to author and start new submission. You guys can see that? Yep. You go to begin submission. So this is a standard one. So, and you would do original article. And then it would ask you to input your title, your running head, your abstract. And even though you have to input all these things, you still have to upload the manuscript in file upload. And you have to upload your figures separately. So for journals, usually tables will be uploaded in the manuscript, but figures have to be uploaded as separate documents. This is usually the case. And supporting information will usually be supplementary appendices and stuff like that. And then attributes, your keywords, authors and institutions. So that's you, the authors and your affiliations and stuff like that. Most journals follow this system. So you can search for the author via email address. You can add an author. You can assign corresponding authors here. And then some journals have this, not all do, but you can recommend potential reviewers. So this journal asks you to suggest at least four preferred reviewers. So this could be people you feel understand your research, people you feel would understand your topic, would review it fairly. And then some journals even ask you to recommend people you feel should not be asked to review. Some journals don't ask for any of this at all. So this differs from journal to journal. And then in details and comments, you can attach your covering letter and also copy paste the text of your covering letter. In funding, you would specify yes or no to funding. You have to put the number of words, manuscript pages, number of tables, total number of figures, number of colored figures. Confirm 
this is very important that the manuscript is only being submitted to this journal. So if you're submitting the manuscript to this journal, you can only submit it to this journal. And this is the case for all journals. So if your manuscript is being considered with this journal, you have to wait until it's presumably rejected before you can send it elsewhere. And obviously you've prepared the manuscript according to this journal. Do you have any conflict of interest? You would say no, because conflict of interest is an incredibly difficult thing to work around. And then previously submitted. So for example, um, if it's any revisions or things like that, yes or no, you would take care of that over here. And then a bunch of other questions that are pretty easy to work around, supporting information, image use, is it an RCT, all of that kind of stuff. For payment, this would usually be if your institution has an agreement or uh, a lot of universities, for example, have deals with journals to get discounts. So if you have, if you know that your university has a payment discount, you can select that option over here with the journal. See, institutional discount. And then information about data availability statement. When all of that is done, so you wouldn't have this red over here, it would all be green. All of this would be green, this would all be accepted, this would all be accepted. At the very end, you would get this option that you have to view it as a PDF. So you would have to click it, view it as a PDF. And only once you've opened the PDF, viewed it, would you then be able to submit it. Very quickly now, because I don't wanna take up too much of your time, quickly just go over the revision process. Okay. So revisions, it is absolutely not the end of the world if you get revisions, it is the most standard thing. So there are technically four stages when it comes to revisions. You could be accepted you could get a minor revision, a major revision, or you could be rejected. So if you're rejected, it's perfectly all right. My paper was once rejected five times before it found its home, and that's perfectly okay. A minor revision is usually a matter of writing, and that is usually quite easy to fix. A major revision is not, not that much of a problem either. It does mean that there are some technical aspects in the actual study that are problematic, but there are some workarounds. It might be a misunderstanding on the reviewer's part. And the fact that they haven't rejected it means that there is a fix. If, if there was a fundamental problem in the study, then they would have just rejected it outright. So a major revision is not the end of the world, it is fixable. So reviewers feedback can be really good. You typically get about two to three reviewers, but there can be four to five. It usually just depends on demand because they are being asked to do it for free. People are not really volunteering as much as they used to to review papers. So reviewers often help you redistribute content into the appropriate sections and they make it more readable. They help you clean up your abstract so that it only contains the essential information. They help you bolster your introduction so that it makes your argument more persuasive. They will often tell you what points you should include. They often say, oh, well, you should have this topic in to enhance your argument. They'll find gaps in your methods because as an outsider, they know what points you should be elaborating on and explaining more. They will strengthen your results because they will ask you often to add more tables or elaborate more on certain things or report on certain findings. And they will often help you provide a more detailed discussion because once again, they will give you points to talk about. That being said, sometimes they can be very difficult and there is often this underlying joke in academia about the dreaded reviewer too. Sometimes they will ask something that has already be, 
been answered in the manuscript multiple times. Sometimes they don't read the whole manuscript. Sometimes they don't read the supplementary material that's provided in the manuscript. Sometimes they provide very repetitive critique. And sometimes they have very wrong assumptions about what your research is about, what your aims were. Sometimes they try to get you to do additional work that has nothing to do with what you set out to do. So don't fear, you can always address these. I think one of the most common complaints that reviewers have is that the findings don't meet aims. They will say that you have oversold your claims, that you are trying to claim something that you haven't done. But the fact that you're being offered a revision means that the oversell wasn't so bad, otherwise you'd have a rejection. So a revision means that they're seeing if you can add more content to be persuasive or that you've met your aims and you could possibly just make them more realistic. So usually your viewers' comments will come back to you in an email looking like this. They might be organized by section and the good will be in with the bad and you'll have to kind of read through the whole thing and pluck out what was said. And I think the best approach to this is to make a table to consider how to roughly respond to each comment. So you put each reviewer, each comment in its own little box and think about how you want to respond to it. Now, it could be your mistake. It could be their mistake, or it could be no one's mistake. Maybe it's just a good suggestion or solution. But the whole point is be prepared to fight, but be polite. And this is just an example of how I approached some of the things they said. It might not make a lot of sense to you because you might not be familiar with the research, but just to show you, the red are some of the things I had done wrong and I was like, okay, I'm gonna address these. The green are where they clearly hadn't read my results and my supplementary material. So I noted that down like, oh, I have to remind them, check the supplementary material. And then the yellow was something that couldn't be helped. And I was like, oh, well, here's a solution that I'll think of. So what you always start off with is just be very sincere and polite. You prepare a response letter. You start with, very formally, you have your header and your whole response, many thanks you know, for your consideration, you have to thank the editorial board, you take the opportunity to thank the reviewers for providing valuable feedback. This is, you have to be, it's sincere, it's a little kiss ass, but it's, it's polite, it's sincere. And I'm gonna just show you some examples of where they were right, where I fought back, and where there were some quick responses. So this was my research where I had developed guidelines on adapting a test for dementia for different cultures. And one was a recommendation from the editor and it's that example from where they said like the table provided too many identifying characteristics. So my response very simply was as requested, yes, I've amended the table. So it's very polite language. And that's what you do in the letter, you go number by number, you provide a comment and then you respond very politely and say how you've addressed it. And where possible, you also use extracts from your actual manuscript with the page number and sometimes even the line number to show how you've actually responded to their argument. So in the next example, you can see they've said that um, they've asked for how I could address something in the discussion, an additional point. And I've made it a point to say, oh, very grateful for this suggestion. And we've now accounted for this in the discussion and I've shown how I've accounted for it. So this is important. It's shown that we've taken it into consideration. Reviewers appreciate this. In the next example, I did not appreciate what the reviewer did. Um, 
In the next one, they, they assumed I was trying to prove an effect. They've said, you know, is there a direction to culture? Did we prove this effect clearly? And that was not what I was trying to do. So the reviewer was making assumptions. So you don't need to understand what I was trying to do in the research. All you need to do is see what I've said, which was that the purpose of this paper was not to observe a direction or the influence of culture. I'm making it very clear. It's not rude. It's just telling them immediately, but that's not what the paper was about. You're allowed to do that. You're allowed to reassert that that was not the aim, that that's not what we were setting out to do. And then I used evidence from my paper to state that that's not what it was about. Same over here, you know, they've said um, they're trying to define what guidelines are and um, they're trying to say, well, this, you know, use another statement instead of guidelines to avoid further misunderstanding. And I, instead of backing down, decided to justify it further because I thought it was worth the argument because sometimes it is worth the argument. So I provided a bit of an explanation as to why I felt it was worth the justification. And in the end, as a means to be polite, right here you can see if the editor insists on a change in terminology, I proposed a solution. We could potentially use the word framework, but we believe guidelines is a clearer, more accurate reference. So it's a compromise. So these are different ways you can respond to reviewers without completely giving in or being a bit nuanced. And then this is just to show you that not all your answers have to be totally lengthy. Some of them can be completely snappy, but this is kind of what a letter is gonna look like. And then one final note, as you are addressing the um, reviewer's responses, obviously you're gonna be making changes to your manuscript. Make sure you highlight those changes as you go along because when you resubmit in the portal, they're going to ask for a tracked version with those highlighted changes and a clean version. So you're going to want to create a duplicate of the highlighted version and then get rid of the highlights. So it's very important you have both those versions. So to make your life easier, just make sure you keep tracking. So that is basically the entire seminar. I'm sorry that we went a bit over time, quite a lot over time, sorry guys. But I hope that it has been useful and that you've learned quite a bit about journal submissions in today's webinar. Are there any questions?